Again, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Let me introduce the panelists first before we jump right into today's topic. First of all, Maria Ramos, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Barclays Africa. She uh, spends most of her time on the continent and in Johannesburg and uh, comes with a very long experience both in macroeconomics from government as well as the private sector and business. We've got Remen McGuire, who is head of global banking at City, comes from New York today, if, if I understand correctly. Um, and I think will be a great addition in putting Africa on the global map and where it stands compared to other regions that are doing just as well or even better. Um, to my right is the Honorable Central Bank Governor of Rwanda, Governor of the National Bank of Rwanda, John Rwangomwa. Thank you so much for coming from Kigali today. And last but not least, of course, uh, the bubbly Hendrik Dutoit, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Investec, a South African investment bank that's doing big things across the continent. Um, so just to frame the discussion a little bit, although I'm, I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with what's bothering us all and what's keeping regulators and bankers awake um, at the moment, <coughs> is that there's this great feeling that the continent and its individual economies and many corporates within those economies are on the cusp of something really great, of really unleashing into the future. And certainly, looking from outside into Africa, there's a lot of talk about that, a lot of talk of Africa rising in fits and starts, but still rising. And one of the key questions and one of the key uh, things that can make that accelerate and grow exponentially or can really arrest that growth is the availability of capital, the access that economies and corporates have to debt as well as equity instruments, and deepening and broadening that across the continent, connecting the continent internally, crucially, but also externally to the rest of the world. And those are roughly the issues we'll be discussing today, as well as how to regulate that best. Um, I'm sure most here would like a light touch on that, but at least normalized, so that uh, there is some predictability in the framework of how capital flows across the continent. Um, so without further ado, let me start with Maria on some initial thoughts on, the, on this question. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Martina, and good morning, everyone. I thought I'd just frame it by giving a sense of where, we, where we've come from and what has happened over the last decade or so. And I thought I'd look at it from a couple of perspectives. I think economic growth is obviously very important and there are different ways of thinking about economic growth. And one of those is to think about what's happened with tra trade flows across the continent uh, for the last decade. So I thought I'd look at trade flows debt markets and equity markets, just to give some perspective. And then just pose some ideas of what I think needs to happen as we think about the development of capital markets into the future. So let me put some numbers out there on, on trade flows. And many of us are very aware of these, but just to, to give a sense of, of what's happened. So if you think on the trade front, and this is according to the IMF statistics, Africa trade grew from around $470 billion in, in 2005 to just over a trillion dollars last year. That's quite significant. Trade with Europe is about 30% of the total. Trade with China has increased fivefold to $162 billion. The trade mix has also changed away from commodities uh, and metals and towards consumer goods and financial services. So there's quite a lot of change going on, and that also gives you a perspective of the importance of changing the, and developing the financial infrastructure in each of the countries across this continent and the continent as a whole. And often we talk a lot about the investment required, the 75 to $85 billion of investment required in infrastructure, and we talk about that in the form of the investment required in roads and ports and railways and pipelines, but the investment that is required in the development of financial infrastructure is just as important if we were going to make all of this happen. So what has happened in capital markets? And if we just look at debt markets, one of the best indicators of economic growth on the continent has been the upward trend in bond issuances. 
And in 2014, new issuances came from Zambia, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, South Africa, Senegal, Ethiopia, and Ghana. Collectively, these countries raised just over $7 billion, uh, with yields on par with some of the southern European countries. And if somebody had said to me when I was Director General of the Treasury just over 10 years ago that this would happen, I would have said, not, not likely. Well, it has happened. I think the interesting thing, and what a particular perspective as I certainly have on this, is that this will accelerate uh, over the next 10 years. Also, if we think about this from the perspective of Africa's inclusion in the global EM, EM debt indices, in 2008, there were just five countries included in the dollar index, representing some $5.6 billion of issuance. This has grown to $36 billion with 15 issuers. That's interesting and important. If we look at equity markets, well, across the continent, we have seen the rise of stock markets in many countries. I think what one perspective, though, is that since the crisis, activity in these markets has re remained relatively muted. That's not everywhere. We've seen uh, you know, country exceptions in countries like Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. But there's much more that can be done to achieve uh, greater progress. So what are some of the things that can be done? Well, to my mind, we need to see a, a lot more being done in terms of reform of the domestic pension fund and mutual fund sector. Growth in these sectors, and there are already a number of initiatives through pension reform, changes in tax incentives for savers, can allow and create better markets and deepen the markets. Uh, the, the markets. Technology is another area. Trading systems in many of our countries have or remain outmoded and somewhat inefficient, and that raises costs, as we all know. And the, although there's a lot of reform underway, accelerating that reform is very important. Countries like Ghana, for example, in 2013, introduced an alternative market to accommodate startups and SMEs. I think we need to see a bit more of that, particularly in a world where we're starting to see technology, innovation, a lot more creativity, raising capital for that is going to be important. And governance in the form of making sure that we create a, a more equal playing field, the rules of the game are better understood so that you can reduce the costs of issuance of listings is going to be really important. Having those harmonized across across countries is going to be uh, important as well. Creating more liquidity in markets, and there are lots of ways of doing this, and one of those is, for example, to allow for inward listings of debt instruments in both local and foreign in countries. If you think about a currency, if you think about the non-bank non financial uh, in, uh, institution asset base in South Africa, it's about eight and a half trillion rand. And you think about the potential, the bank, bank assets are about five trillion rand. If you think about the potential of that and the liquidity in that, uh, you begin to get a sense of how much more can actually be done. And then finally, before we open up, uh, or you know, we move on and I conclude my comments, I think all of this has to be underpinned by sound macroeconomic policies. Um, I guess without that, we're just not going to be able to sustain the development of markets. And we've had a decade of solid, sound macroeconomic policies. We saw median deficits come down to around 0.5%. We've seen post the crisis, those deficits increase to around 4%. So I think we're starting to see some buildup of fiscal pressure in some countries, and we need to make sure that that doesn't create macroeconomic instability 
that can actually hinder the progress and the development of domestic capital markets across the continent. So let me stop there. Yeah, and, and definitely increased sovereign access to international to capital. capital markets um, is already building debt loads, which the IMF has already said could be something to watch for the future. So it's certainly not something to go and a binge on, as we're seeing from the Eurozone anyway. Raymond, where does this fit into what's happening elsewhere? What, what lessons are there for Africa in other parts of the world? And in the current moment, how does it compare in terms of attractiveness? First, let me say I, it's an honor to be here with uh, you and the other distinguished panelists. Uh, we have been in Africa, we city have been in Africa uh, for 50 years. We're in 101 countries around the world. We, are, have, uh, we have a presence in Africa in 16 countries. To put this in a global context, as we think about the continent, and we know that there are 55 countries here, but as we think about the continent in total relative to what's taking place around the world, from a geoeconomic standpoint, Africa uh, is of the top 15 growth geographies in the world, it's in the top 10. So it is important to a macro, global macro uh, equation. With respect to investment in Africa, the investment dollars today um, are fixed income dollars. If you think about the issuances that have occurred, you reference some of the country issuances to put this in context. In, in the year 2000, there were $3.5 billion of uh, capital outstanding in Africa. In 2010, uh, there was $13.5 billion. And in 2014, there was $74 billion worth of capital outstanding. Now, how does the capital, uh, who are the issuers? It's primarily first, it goes sovereigns. So much of that issuance is sovereigns. And then it goes to, uh, it, then it goes to the, the uh, financial services industry. As we've seen here, we have over the past two to three years, $2 billion worth of capital issued to the financial services industry, the Zenith, the access banks of the world, where they've accessed the capital markets at 500 plus billion, million dollars or so. So there's a lot of confidence from uh, primarily European investors because most of the capital that's been raised on the fixed income side is in the Eurobond market. And by the way, given some of the successes that the continent has enjoyed, spreads have come in, so yields have now been much more attractive. We saw the largest issuances uh, in the continent 10 years from Ethiopia, which has been pretty attractive. We've seen some attractive issuances from Kenya, mm -hmm. some attractive issuances from Cote d'Ivoire. So there is a confidence in the marketplace notwithstanding some of the uh, headwinds that are out there. When it comes to the equity markets, we've had fewer successes, but some successes. We saw the, uh, the uh, IPO of Seplot, which was a successful, successful IPO that took place uh, on the African exchanges, on the London exchanges. So as I step back and look at the continent, there is a view that as you think about macro growth, that it will be facilitated in large part what takes place here. There are clearly headwinds. But the view is that as you think about the future and you think about where growth is going to be engineered, it comes from the continent. Uh, we'll, I imagine, talk later about some of the headwinds, but we have a lot of confidence in what take, what's taking place here. We think that the infrastructure is developing such that we can facilitate capital flows outside of just the fixed income capital flows. If you think about what's important to the, to the development of these markets, you have to have both a balance of equity and a balance of fixed income. At some point, I imagine we'll talk about the size of the exchanges relative to GDP. Uh, in, in the developed markets, you have multiples of the uh, debt and equity markets over GDP of two times. In the emerging markets, you have uh, equity and debt to GDP of less than one time. So there's clear upside to the development of the capital markets. We'll talk about some of the principles that are necessary for that development, but there's clear upside here. Again, headwinds, which we will potentially address, but uh, we think that as a growth geography, it's an important uh, and vital growth geography. Right. Thanks. And John, I mean, from a regulator's perspective, because we talk a lot about putting in this vital infrastructure, where does the central bank come in and 
what's, what's the idea behind normalizing that, at least on a regional level, um, just to make things a little simpler and a little less confusing? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I think building on what my colleagues have already said, we, we are in a better position today as Africa to talk of developing our capital markets compared to where we were 10 years ago. Uh, I think that the biggest prerequisite for any development of a capital market is economic stability. And as Maria said, I think this, this has been greatly achieved over the last 10 years. Today, we have averaging inflation of around 6% for quite some time for many countries uh, and even others below uh, 5%. So the issues of hyperinflation in Africa, we would say in many countries, is, is history. So that gives confidence to, to, to investors and to, to development of uh, financial products. And as, as talking about regulation, one other big achievement you see across African countries is opening up our markets. It's opening up our capital accounts. There are no uh, few countries still have controls over flow of capital in and out. So that allows us to attract uh, foreign investment to, to our continent. Uh, the other important factor is uh, maybe linked to our region in East Africa is working to integrate our markets because we realize that the, the key limiting factor to this development of our markets is the, the depth of the markets on individual country basis. Uh, the liquidity is, is not enough. The, the products on the market are not uh, enough to, to drive really the growth of the market. So we are working as the five East African countries, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Burundi to, to link our, our capital markets. Uh, as we said, we are not really unifying them into one capital market, but we're integrating them. Uh, at least we, we now have four uh, capital markets or stock exchanges within our countries, and we are we are linking them one by harmonizing our, regi our regulatory framework, legal and regulatory framework. So whoever is playing with any market within the region, you're treated the same way whether you're in Kigali or Nairobi or Dar es Salaam or Kampala. Uh, the other thing we've, we are doing is linking the, the infrastructure, the, the securities depository, the, the, the trading platforms, uh, and we've already we already see ourselves as one market. So like a Kenyan investor coming to Rwanda will be treated as a Rwandan investor on the Rwandan stock exchange, which is the same across, uh, across the board. So th that somehow helps us to, to, to deal with the issue of depth. And uh, <coughs> so we have at least East Africans investing freely across the, the markets. And that's a good development compared to where we are uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the other important thing is the payment systems. Today, uh, when you transact on the market, the, the settlements are done, uh, in most cases, real time. You don't have to wait for two, three days for, for settlements to be done. And, and that also helps us to, 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 to improve on our capital markets. I think that the, the, the points made by Maria on opening up the international market, uh, having African countries issuing debt to the international market, that has opened us up to, to the international investors, which wasn't the case, again, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we looked at as, uh, of course, people used to call us a hopeless continent. But I think the biggest problem, we're all grappling with the issue of debt burden, HIPIC and the MDRI. We're all working on cancellation of debt. And after cancellation of debt, uh, any investor would not be willing to, to, to relate with a country that has just gone to seek for debt cancellation. But, but after 10 years, we built a track record that now uh, international investors have confidence in how we manage our economies. And when you look at the, the subscriptions on any debt issued from, from, like in Rwanda, Rwanda when we issued our first euro bond in 2013, uh, the subscription was 10 times the size of what we had put on the market, which has been the case in, with the other sovereigns. So the appetite from the, uh, the international investors to invest in African debt is really high. And that gives us uh, hope, because the other limiting factor we have today in developing our capital markets is the level of savings. The, the savings are still very low, domestic savings averaging about 20% in many African countries. Uh, 
Uh, and that can't help us to, to develop our markets. Therefore, this link and opening up and the appetite we see from international investors helps us to cover uh, that gap. I think the other important factor that also uh, acts as uh, an advantage to, to developing our market is the, the debt levels of, of our countries, whether sovereign debt or even private debts. Many African countries are way below 50% of debt to their GDP, and so the room to to issue new debt instruments on, on the international market is, is still big. So I would say we, where we are today in terms of the, uh, the environment we are working in, in terms of our relationship with international investors, but also the, the regulatory framework in general that, that allows free flow of capital in and out of our economies uh, gives us a good advantage to, 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 to be on the right footing to grow our capital markets. Sure. Um, but it's not just about debt, and surely borrowing shouldn't be taken for granted. It's, uh, it's a function of what's happening elsewhere. So what about equity? What about the equity side? What about the investment side? And do we really have to depend on money flowing from the US or Europe? Um, is there not more to be done internally by African money investing in Africa? Martina, that, you're asking a very important question. And just to correct one thing, I, I'm a humble investor for my day job. I, I, I don't look after the banking side of investing. I look after the investment, the asset management side. So savings mar markets really matter. And I don't compete with Raymond. I use his services. Uh, very glad to know that firms like City are in there building capital markets. But from, from our point of view, is uh, I want to link to John's last point. If we don't, and Maria also raised it, if we don't get savings markets developed and, and get the culture of savings, domestic savings in uh, across Africa um, going, then we'll always be dependent on foreign finance. Now, foreign finance is great, and you've got to take it when you can, can get it, but it's not always available. I mean, there's a sort of quite an ominous comment in the, you know, in the Financial Times, it was, I think it was yesterday when the Chairman of the Financial Stability Board and the World Bank Chief Financial Officer warned about liquidity challenges. Now, in Africa, we understand liquidity challenges. Maybe the rest of emerging markets have to learn. But there is a withdrawal. There is a risk premium going to be imposed, busy being imposed on emerging markets. And Africa will not escape that and has not escaped it. So if you then have, can use the, the, the savings pools either on the, on the continent or in the regions to, to continue activity. And I think South Africa is a case study that is not well enough stu studied because it has very developed capital markets as deep as any developed country uh, relative to GDP. And it has managed to sustain and mobilize in, in, in quite lean economic times, uh, especially during the isolation periods, managed to sustain economic activity and investment activity because it used recycled domestic savings effectively. And now, under uh, the, the current government and uh, one of the previous finance ministers, they made a very, very important rule change. They allowed the South African savings pool, the retirement pool and long-term pool, which is about $1.5 trillion, to take an additional 5% into the rest of Africa. And that money is starting, and if you look at the number of funds that have been set up on the equity side, most of them are cornerstone funded by Southern African capital. And so I think we've got an important precedent, and we've seen how it worked, and it has driven the evolution of markets, but there's a lot more to do. And I'm very encouraged by Nigeria. Their savings will now go, the last number I saw was 40, I think it must be close to a $50 billion savings pool onshore, copying essentially the Chilean model, which means it's really easy to understand as an outsider, the money gets administered properly, and will eventually build initially debt markets and then equity markets. Right now, equity markets are still very much driven by the foreign investor and then the domestic private investor, rather than the domestic institutional investor. So my plea would be that we help encourage not single country, because many of the countries are too small, but on a regional basis, uh, strong domestic savings institutions and savings recycling institutions, both insurance and asset management. And I'm very encouraged by uh, you know, John's region. Um, you know, I've never heard a president or a prime minister speak about savings and retirement. It's mm -hmm. too long for the political horizon in a democratic country, yet the Kenyan president, the Rwandan president, uh, 
Ugandan president, they talk about these things. Um, and, and, and I think East Africa is, 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 is setting a great example of how a region could cooperate. And I hope the other two big, area, big countries, South Africa and Nigeria, can draw in the markets around them. SADC already has good infrastructure. So I'm encouraged, but it's early stage, it's not large, and it will be driven by the continental investor much more than the marginal foreign. Although, very exciting, and that's my last point, we've seen big almost too big, but big private equity money raised. And the big US private equity firms are, have declared their intent, not by raising dedicated funds, but by using existing funds. So we, for example, co-invest, uh, we've just do, recently done a co-investment with Carlisle, where it's domestic capital, international capital together uh, on the private side. The problem is we still don't have good enough exits on the public markets, and that's what we need to work on. Right. But, so East African community is probably, if, if you lis listen to this side of the debate, um, the best integrated region, financially at least, on the continent. But we were discussing earlier about, about the importance of deepening that and creating more infrastructure and, 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 and common shared regulations around that. Why is it so important? Well, I think it's just so important for the reasons we've all been discussing. You, it's, you need to get harmonization, you need to deepen the domestic pools of, uh, of funding, and, uh, and you need to make sure that, as, uh, uh, you know, as I think everybody has said, you, know, you, need to get, you need to be able to attract, to generate the savings, and you can do that by having more, uh, you know, more harmonization, better, better, uh, better markets, more integrated markets. So I think getting, getting this done as East Africa has done on a regional basis is a really good starting point. And you can see the benefits of it. If, you, if you're an investor and you know that whether you listed on the Kenyan exchange or you listed on the Rwandan exchange, it, you've got you face the same sets of, of rules and you're treated the same. I think that that's an enormous benefit, and so it's about getting it's about getting that liquidity. It's about getting the 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 depth in these markets. As individual countries, we're just too small. Collectively, we count, and it's about making sure we we all understand that. It's about bringing down the costs. It's about bringing down the barriers, it's about creating the right incentives. It's then also about making sure on the back of that we can develop the instruments. Um, and, you know, like, like City, we run a large business uh, across this continent. We, we, in 12 countries, Barclays has been on the continent for, in some countries, for 150 years. And one of the things we've done is roll out a lot of platforms to ensure that we can trade uh, and we can deepen our presence and we can contribute to the deepening of capital markets. So whether that's through the rolling out of our trading systems, our foreign exchange systems, our uh, cash management systems, or the development of new instruments in markets like Kenya where we've listed NCDs or uh, the listing of uh, new uh, instruments in, in countries like Botswana. It's about deepening and creating the availability of new investable uh, instruments that people can, then can look into. So it's, it really is about, about that. It's creating those opportunities. And what are the biggest obstacles, do you think, looking at it from the outside? You, you've clearly said that on a on the city level, and also personally, you've identified an opportunity that can't be missed here, so you want to be present. But what, what do you guys diagnose as being the biggest problems towards realizing that opportunity? The, first, let me, let me build on some comments here with respect to the South African model. Mm -hmm. The South African listed exchange is about a trillion dollars. Average daily trading volume is a billion dollars. The Nigerian exchange is $100 billion, with an average trading of about $25 million. Mm -hmm. 
So 25 million versus a billion, and 100 billion versus a trillion. GDP of Nigeria is 575 billion. GDP of South Africa is 300 and some odd billion. Five years ago, the largest GDP, the largest economy across the continent of Africa was South Africa. Its ability to retain the capital markets has been sustained. The opportunity that exists for other geographies to increase, like Nigeria, is clear relative to the GDP. What are the hallmarks that we've learned from other places in the world? One, you need to have for investors, for the investor, for the equity investors. Uh, presume, and lessons learned from other emerging geographies, you need to have strong on the ground operations, number one. Number two, you need to have strong management teams, strong visible management teams with depth of management. Number three, and perhaps equally if not more importantly, more heavily weighted, uh, are management principles. And what do I mean by management principles? Governance, whether or not there is a level of independence and transparency in the leadership at the board level, transparency in the accounting, a record of social and environmental responsibility. Those are the hallmarks of enterprises that have attracted equity investors around the world. They attract the private equity investors. They would attract, to the extent that there's a story, the retail equity investors, and they would attract the large institutional investors. Those are hallmarks. And so if you ask what are some of the challenges here that have yet to be realized in large scale, it would be those enterprises that have those fundamental principles as part of how they operate. The level of transparency that has been reflected in the sovereign issuances where you get 10 to 15 times oversubscription in these issuances gives you confidence that there's an appetite for investors both within country, within region, as well as outside investors to invest in this marketplace. If you look across other emerging markets and look at the hallmarks of where the investment has occurred, each in each instance you see those principles being applied. They have been less prevalent in these markets. Uh, because of the reasons that have been discussed. Right. Um, I'll turn to you guys now for a few questions. If you can please keep them brief, make sure that they are questions, not statements, although I'm sure each and every one of you is qualified to have um, informed and strong opinions. Um, and so we can just get you more involved in our conversation today. If you can put your hand up, please. Yeah, thank you. If you could just introduce yourself also. Get a mic to the gentleman. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chifipa Muhango, uh, Chief Economist of Aslam uh, One of the challenges you face on the African continent is that you've got a very impressive uh, uh, GDP growth uh, numbers on paper. Uh, but then when you talk about the issues of the financial markets on the African continent, I'm not sure when you look at this thing from the point of view of a small businessman. Uh, because the topic we're addressing today, if anyone uh, thinks about it, they all think about big, big business. Mm. And my experience on the African continent, traveling on the African continent, as well as also doing some business on the African continent, you know, the key challenges we face is more impacting on the small business player. And then the other big challenge is that you know, uh, as long as we don't have confidence of each other's calluses on the continent, this issue of integration of the African uh, capital markets will never happen. Where, for instance, uh, you are in a country like Malawi, which uses a kwacha, you can, if you take that kwacha to a neighboring country like Mozambique, I mean, you, you won't use that. Yeah. Uh, so for a small business player, for instance, what will happen that, no? He has to change that Malawian kwacha into a US dollar, and then when he goes to Mozambique, convert it back uh, to the Mozambican currency. The transactional costs involved, <clears throat> the original amount, which was, I suppose was 10, 10 US dollars, at the end of the day when it's in Metikai, it, it will become five, five US dollars. Yeah. So these issues that also need to be addressed is the cost of transactions. So I'm not sure what's the uh, view, maybe from the governor, as well as from uh, Ramos, uh, on the, I think they are more experienced on that space as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Mm. I mean, it, it is interesting, and if uh, the people who are, who are listening from outside the continent perhaps would think that we, the continent has arrived and it's all PE and IPOs, but what we're hearing here is a bit about nuts and bolts, right? The not very sexy, not very exciting stuff that developed economies have been doing for a very long time and got them where they are today, although arguably that may not be the best place to be right now. <laughs> but how, how does that work? How, and even how does... How does the, uh, the, the official sector, the, the central banks and the finance ministers and the governments encourage lending um, to that very spine of the economy that you can't really leapfrog, even as Africa leapfrogs other parts of development? Mm. Yeah, I, I think one, uh, as the biggest challenge, in fact, we still have today is uh, as we are trying to develop our markets private sector involvement is not yet that big. Uh, I think based on his example, South African uh, stock exchange is, uh, is really big because they have established private sector players on, this, uh, on the market. Uh, and you find in a part of the world, it's, we, we're still mainly dealing with government securities that we are trying to use to develop the markets. Uh, and the, the challenges with the private sector is instilling the corporate governance principles and the, any private sector issuing paper on the capital markets, you, issues of transparency and accountability and governance are high on the agenda. Uh, and so that creates a big challenge to the small uh, SMEs, the small and medium enterprises to, 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 to be able to achieve the standards required to list on the stock exchange. I think, as, as Maria said, maybe she should say more about that, uh, the experience or the example of Ghana, where they had create a window to, 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 to handle that. But what, what's important today, what, for example, what we are doing in Rwanda, we have uh, a new law uh, creating collective investment schemes where small savers could invest in, in a fund, buying units in a fund, and this fund when it's built into a big fund now, it can invest and can be active on the market. So the small savers are active on the market through uh, uh, secondary uh, vehicles, if I put it like that. Uh, but the biggest challenge, what's, at least what we are trying to do, uh, or what our capital markets authority is trying to do, is to support the SMEs to bring them to a level where they can uh, have reliable uh, accounts uh, that can be uh, monitored and followed before you bring them to, to issue any uh, 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 an IPO or any other paper to, to, to the market. So by the end of the day, if, if, the, development, if the capital market is really developed, one, it, it acts as vehicle to finance the big corporates and, and therefore the, the, the other, the banks will focus on supporting uh, SMEs than, like today in most of our economies, the banks are, are really dealing with financing the corporates and they ignore the small and medium. Yet corporates have the capacity to raise money, which will be even much cheaper from the market itself than going through commercial banks. And therefore, retail banks would focus on supporting these small uh, so in actual fact, when we talk of developing the, the capital markets, not just the capital markets in isolation, it's probably the financial sector in general that will support the development of the small and medium enterprises as well. But That's you know, I... before Maria answers, because she can answer a lot better about the costs of you know, foreign exchange between small markets, et cetera, but I think it's a very important question the gentleman from uh, Arsenal Metal asked. But I'm not sure it's the right question. I, I think we need to develop capital markets for the larger businesses, get it done. Because if I travel in, in frontier Africa, as opposed to the more developed parts of Africa, it's easy to find the billionaire. It's not that easy to find the millionaire. Right? We want lots of millionaires, lots of successful businesses, which have probably been spun out of, uh, or, or people who've, who've learned their trade in larger transnational companies that operate on the continent, made some money uh, by their equity options, and then started businesses funding their cousins, funding other people. Um, you'll never get a, a structured financial system doing that. And I think the best effect, uh, the best way you fund SMEs 
is actually through private wealth that, 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 that goes into a system where it works on trust. But you need to create that. To order to create that, you need to get enough successful businesses which can exit, get the right multiple and sell. So I don't think we should put the burden on the regulators now to say, how do you do you know, financing a very small business successfully through your capital market system, it has to spill down because not even in the most developed countries in the world do they do it effectively. But how does it happen there? It happens through the, the enormous circulation of private wealth. We need to create that private middle class wealth and you'll see the cost of business drop significantly. So I think we've got two debates here. One is getting the capital market right for the call it the formal businesses, and the other one is to look at the ecosystem, as the governor said, of course, then there's still the big question about efficient banking cross-border and efficient lending cross-border, which Maria is far more qualified to answer than I. So I, th I think, Andrew, you, you touched on a very important point, and that is you need the ecosystem, right? So I think you need to do this across multiple layers. So I think you do need to continue to develop very efficient capital markets uh, and and we're going to have to be able to continue funding governments, corporates, uh, getting the costs of doing that as efficiently as possible. Um, but there's also no doubt that we, we have to do and be a lot more uh, creative about how we think about financing small and medium-sized enterprise particularly across this co on a continent where the bulk of business is in that part of the market. So I think you know, the gentleman from Asilo has pointed out a very important, uh, a very important area. You know, probably the ratio in my, my mind or the number in my head is of something in the order of 85, 90% of business across this, businesses across this continent can be broadly defined as small or medium-sized enterprises. So finding ways of efficiently financing those businesses is really important. I know as a bank, it's something that we, we're very focused on. I mean, we've set up a, a small and medium enterprise fund. We've got enterprise development centers. We've created portals for small and medium-sized enterprises, and, um, and we've helped train you know, tens of thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. And I know that as much as we do, there's still a lot more that can be done, and, and we need to be a lot more creative about it. I think in, in, this is one of those areas where actually the availability of technology and digital banking creates new opportunities for us, uh, both in terms of the provision and the reduction of costs uh, in terms of getting banking to small and medium-sized enterprises and, and making it more accessible and inclusive. Um, I think the other thing we need to also do is to recognize that making payments across borders is expensive. And, uh, and there's still a lot of regulatory um, uh, burden in getting a payment made across, across, burden, across borders. And so the cost of making payments across borders is, is, is something we need to all work on. It's, it's incredibly expensive. And so, you know, if, even if we have a great digital product and a create a great digital wallet, you're often having to deal with exchange controls. Uh, you know, you have to deal with KYC. You have to deal with all of the regulatory stuff that by the time you get the payment across to the end user on the other side, you know, you've added a significant amount of cost and I think we, have, we can make that a lot easier working between the private sector and the regulators to reduce the costs. Particularly in a world, we, we talk a lot about integration and we still That's have enormous burdens to move goods and services, financial, financial capital and people across our borders on this continent. Unless we can reduce all of that, growth is always going to be suboptimal on this continent.
unless we really mean what we say when we talk about integration, which is bringing down the barriers for people to move, for capital to move, and for goods and services to move, it doesn't matter. We can build the best infrastructure in the world. It's not going to deliver the goods. My, my, just, my, just one observation here that we've learned from our own strategy, which may be applicable here, is we have a strategy for what we call emerging market strategy, which is to essentially support the large emerging multinationals. Here would be the MTNs, the Napsters, the Woolworths of the world. It may be the case that you can develop a capital markets if you develop a pan, I'm going to like to say pan-African strategy, but certainly a regional strategy where you can have regional champions that can create the scale that can bring down some of the cost barriers. 90% of the businesses being formed here being SMEs. To have a, a primarily local strategy will, I think, hinder some of the ability to attract the capital. A pan-regional strategy, then a pan-African strategy could attract a lot of capital. And a pan-regional strategy allows you to operate with a higher level of productivity and more efficiency that will therefore bring in the capital. Focusing, and, and perhaps it's the reality of the marketplace, focusing primarily on the local SMEs will get you only so far. In order to scale this, you're going to have to come up with local champions that, that can be supported by whatever infrastructure ecosystem so they have the skill to bring down the costs. Absent that, you're going to come in, you're going to run into the issues that you've outlined. But, but I think the point here, yeah, breaking down the barriers, on, on, in, in the, the, the three regions in sub-Saharan Africa, need to intra-regionally really effectively and efficiently break down those barriers regularly, yeah. otherwise not invent different rules uh, just Hendrick, for the country. Everyone talks about that. Every conference you it go to, happen. every WEF, every That's African Development Bank, that is all, it's all about regional integration, starting with roads and infrastructure mm. and going to financial infrastructure and intangibles. And it's not easy. Europe's been, the European Union's been doing it for decades and they're struggling with it and they're now regretting it because they're at the bottom of the cycle and they're like, mm, I'm not sure we want your labor anymore and maybe we should close those borders. So uh, how do you do I, it? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm those geographies. Yeah. I mean, you have some mm. really well-developed economies there. Of course. I'm, Notwithstanding I'm just the, picking, the, I'm picking remember, one issue. A, that, yeah. but, and but, I think we so. must just be very careful because, you know, one down cycle doesn't doesn't create is not it's just a cycle doesn't call the model into doesn't question, call right? the model Absolutely. into question so and I, I I think we must just make sure that we don't Sorry. we don't over you know we don't overstate the problems we have a lot more to gain by integrating our markets right by creating the opportunity for people to move I around think those arguments are really convincing and but why is it so hard to do well, I for frankly Frankly, I think it takes, and this, I know this is always controversial when you say it, but it actually takes political will to yeah, get right. it done. You know, there's, and you know, it's, if you bring down, if you, if you have the political will, you can really get a lot of the stuff done. You know, you can't get, you cannot get, you know, a, un, the rules of the game harmonized with, out getting the people who can make these rules around the table agree the rules. And so it starts with getting the political will and then getting the other actors that make this happen mm. around the table. So get the political will to do it and then you have to get the private sector around the table and say, this is what we need to do, can we all get behind this and let's get this done. Then I think it begins to happen. No, no, actually, to your point, just to, to this point, the yeah. example exists, notwithstanding the challenges, the example exists in the European Union, mm. where as a union was being yeah. formed, the experts said, given the cultural differences here and the political differences, it would never occur. But the example is just as you cited. There was a the political will at the top, and then they brought the private sector together. Clearly, they're having challenges now, given this cycle. I've never heard private sector people before asking the government to lead something. This is fascinating. No, I, I think well, we, just have to be, we just have to appreciate where we are. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I think the example of East Africa I've been referring yeah. to is a good one, because today our presidents are leading the, these initiatives. And because of that, we've been able to break many barriers. Mm -hmm. 
today, East Africans travel using just identity cards. You no longer one. You don't need. You don't even need to have your passport to move across our borders. We've now linked our our communication as one network area across uh, the East African community, and that is feeding now into the mobile. Uh, uh, payment systems as one network. And that reduces tremendously the cost of uh, paying money across the borders. And what we are doing now as central banks, we've, we've just signed uh, an MOU, uh, and we are moving to currency convertibility. So the issue of first changing into dollars, then back to uh, local currency, that we want to, to, to remove. Uh, and we've established an East African payment system where you easily uh, uh, make payments across the border. So, but the push from our presidents mm -hmm. has yeah. really And let's not pretend. I mean, yeah. I think we all know that it has not been smooth. These are all outcomes that yeah. I understand, you know, leadership in East Africa takes pride in, but it has been a very bumpy ride into this marriage. Sure. I, I don't want to, I'd is, really yeah, love to take yeah. one more question. But, I mean, I I think, I think no one is saying in any of this is smooth, and it's sure. taken the European Union decades to get there, and we know it's not smooth. So of none, none of this is smooth, none of this is, comes without consequences or even costs. But not to do it is also incredibly no, think, yeah. costly, and I think we, this conference is about reimagining Africa. Think 10 years ahead, think about a you know, regions on this continent if, where people can move around across East Africa, across Southern Africa, across West Africa without needing passports, where you can make payments, where you can have currency convertibility, where you don't have exchange controls to worry about. And I think you've got a different uh, kind of economic opportunity. Of the arguments are completely compelling. Let me take one more question because we have 10 minutes. Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint. Uh, but hopefully we can all chat afterwards. Maybe the lady here on the left. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Toin Sani from United Capital PLC. And um, a, an example has been made of Nigeria and um, specifically the size of our capital market relative to the size of the GDP. And um, one of the issues that have come up in recent times is how to get the proposed champions like MTN, who operate in our market and do make significant revenues, to actually list you know, their securities on the market. And the question has been, should it be a carrot or a stick method? And um, the debate has been ongoing. And I just wondered whether members of this panel had a recommendation as what would be the ideal model, actually, to encourage and bring in those kind of major players that are in our markets and whose um, activities, obviously, would have the huge capacity to grow our capital market if, if they came on board. Thank you. Anyone interested in taking this specifically? I, I would just say the, uh, uh, the, 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 the two key points. Firstly, if you talk about, if you're just going to list foreign subsidiaries, mm -hmm. you want foreigners to come to your country and build a business, create employment, and MTN has made a major contribution to Nigeria, benefited massively from Nigeria. To necessarily ask them to complicate their corporate structure and list the local subsidiary. You could if it's an extractive industry, but it's not always feasible. It should really be about bringing the domestic champions or the regional champions through and ask MTN or the foreigners to use the domestic debt markets mm. to finance themselves, to help develop the debt markets that, because they're great benchmark issuers, they're quality issuers. They, I mean, debt market and real estate market really could be driven by you know A-grade foreign tenants or top quality foreign issuers and not necessarily con conf confusing the corporate structure. If they are a local business that's been acquired, of course it would be mm. great to advocate for them to, sh to share the equity and stay internally, but it's about getting the, the sort of the next level, the access banks, those guys to a scale, the, 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 <laughs> taking the, 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 the various Dangote businesses as he sells out taking them to, to proper public positioning, free, freely traded positionings in the local market as regional champions. But the, the point I just wanted to add when we didn't discuss it today is, and that's where East Africa has a lot of work to do, um, you have to build a proper yield curve in the debt market before any capital mm. market can, wor can work. In other words, governments have to have a proper debt management function mm. 
when I issue, even if I don't need it, long-term domestic debt, you know, all across the term structure, so it's priced, off which the private sector can be priced and off which we can develop the much needed, which we haven't discussed, corporate bond market. Mm. Because corporates don't always want to borrow at banks they, from banks because banks are going to charge a lot more in the new world post-financial crisis. Uh, they want to borrow from the markets. And that is where we need to sort of think and focus with a policymaker. And I, if we get that right, and I, and I think interestingly, uh, there's some very encouraging signs in Nigeria. But we, uh, a significant part of what we do is investing in local currency denominated debt across the continent. Mm -hmm. But if you can't price off something, you can't give it, and that's where I think coming back to the MTN issue, help use the foreigners as domestic debt issuers. benchmark issuers, and they'll probably do it to, to win favor with the local market. Yeah, I agree with that. Right. Maybe time for one, one last question. Um, I haven't turned my back on anyone for so long. I'm so sorry, <laughs> just checking. OK, what about the gentleman over there? My name is George Mbima. I'm with the IFC Asset Management Company. And this question is for Mr. Dutoit, or Dutoit, I'm spelling your name, sorry. Um, okay, George. The question, you mentioned in passing that uh, perhaps there's been too much private equity money uh, raised for the continent. Could you please comment on the too much part of that statement? <laughs> I, I think there's never too much. Let's just be clear. There's never, never too, too much, much money. money. Uh, but because private equity comes in vintages and in seasons, you find that investors tend to allocate or commitments at the same time when it's in fashion. Now, we all know there was a big you know, emerging market fashion which spilled over into a frontier market and an Africa fashion. Uh, and then the big allocations come in one year. And then investors are sometimes forced to deploy capital slightly too quickly. So I, I would just say we had nothing. You don't, George, don't remember the time when we started when I couldn't even convince the guys in our office who are living in Africa and investing in Africa to invest Pan-African. That, that was 20 years ago. And so there was, a, there was a time when very little formal capital moved across. And so to look for the sort of mid, big deal, we, for example, have decided to focus on the mid-sized deal because we think there are a lot more. The, the mythical $500 million deal or billion dollar deal is just not there's just not enough of them, and you'll chase them, and you may overpay. If you could spread private equity patiently over 20 years, of course the money isn't enough, and of course we need a lot more. So take my, con my comment in the context that all good things seem to come at once, and then they don't come when you need it. It's like your banker. Your banker is always there when you have money, We're when you don't there. have money, <laughs> but Maria's always there. Maria's always been there for us. So it's only in that context, and I, th I think I'd really encourage more and more private equity involvement. Mm -hmm. I would just not expect that, uh, you know, that, and if you look at the volume of large deals, that they would materialize overnight. Once the public markets are big enough, for the exits to happen, you'll see bigger and bigger deals happening because then people see a door. So that's, that's the co uh, context in which I commented. I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to wrap it up for this morning. Um, seems like regional integration is, and, and a lot of initiative and courage demanded of, of elites and political elites on the continent is one of the key messages. But also, don't over-depend on foreigners. Do it yourself if you can and an encouragement of a savings culture that can really deepen and make those markets more liquid, um, as well as clear, integrated regulation that can assist those markets to develop. Um, I'm sure these characters around here are going to be contributing uh, substantively to, to that in the future as they have in the past. Thanks so much for joining us. And sorry we can get to all your questions. Um, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.